so good afternoon, everybody. I can see some very friendly faces here. There's probably some folks who have seen presentation versions before. My name is Monica Chen. I'm the National Programs Director of the Factory Farming Awareness Coalition. We're a nonprofit that actually started at UC Berkeley when we were students. We just realized, like Lauren said, there's a lot of horrific things that are happening in the world and a lot of these issues are interrelated. So we started to go to our professors and said, hey, you're talking about sustainability, you're talking about social justice, you're talking about public health, but you're not talking about factory farming and food. And so we started to give those presentations and they've been so well received that we've become a national organization with offices around the country, which is really exciting. We speak to many students every single year and my hope in coming to today's the Veg Fest is not just to give you a standard presentation because I get the sense that a lot of you <laughs> have a lot of background knowledge on this. So I wanted to do a little bit of a training also where I teach you how I respond to some of the questions that I get asked all the time. Sometimes people hear a name and might be really antagonistic. So you might be wondering how do I talk to them? How do I respond to, well, if you were stranded on a deserted island and you had to eat this pig, like would you, right? Like those types of questions. I've heard it all, and I've learned to meet people where they're at, and we still get to do the work that we do, and I feel very grateful for that. So, next slide. Today, I want to briefly go over, just again, a general presentation, talking about what factory farming is. This is, I'm sure, a very veg-friendly crowd. We are not going to show you anything that's you know, bloody or gory. We never go into presentations at schools and say, hey, let's traumatize everybody, <laughs> make everybody go vegan right away, just because shop. We really are trying to educate people up that this is something that's going on and here are some of the things that we can do about it that are at an individual level and at a government macro level as well. We'll delve into some environmental impacts. I'll go really quickly through racial justice since I think Lauren did a really great job talking about that and then we'll delve into solutions and answering some of those questions and hopefully training some of you as presenters as well. At least, maybe not even a formal way, but you're all ambassadors. And I think that one of the main things that prevents people from eating more plant-based is not having a friend or somebody that they can connect to. So if you can be that person for another one, that's great. All right, next slide. So how many of you sang Old McDonald's when you were children? You know that song, right? We all did. And I grew up in Sunnyvale. And I remember driving along 280 on my way to San Francisco and seeing cows on the side of the road. And whenever I shopped at a grocery store, I would see ads that looked like this, that showed this, these happy cows having a wonderful time. And to me, that's what farming always was. But the truth of the matter is that's not what we have anymore. We have these things called concentrated animal feeding operations, or CAFOs, which are defined by the intensive confinement of thousands or tens of thousands of animals in a single space to maximize product, to maximize profit. How we got here is actually an interesting story. So is anybody familiar with Celia Steele? Back in 1923, right? She was raising chickens in her backyard. And amazingly, in Delaware, in 1923, they seemed to have catalogs. She ordered 50 chickens from a catalog, and the catalog company messed up, and they sent her 500. So if you're a little Celia in Delaware in winter, anybody been to Delaware in winter? You have, Louise? Oh my goodness. <laughs> well, you can't just raise 500 chickens in Delaware in the winter, so she put them all inside the shed. And if you don't give chickens sunlight, what critical vitamin are they missing out on? D. D, right, so they should have died. But new supplements had been invented, new incubation technology, those 500 chickens survived, and she thought, wow, that was really profitable. So the next year she ordered 1,000 chickens, then 10,000 chickens. About a decade later, she still had about 250,000 chickens when her neighbors still had only their original. This is the growth of factory farming. And again, these are some of the technologies that help to increase its growth. What about petaluma chicken coops? <clears throat> Sorry, what? Petaluma chicken coops. They were petaluma. In petaluma, there were all these chicken coops so they turn on the same thing. I remember chicken coops. Is that what you're yeah. nostalgic for chicken coops? No, yeah, but they were. I remember the, the wire. <laughs> yes. OK, so we're going to from 1923 1923 is 2019 now. My question is, who here knows how many animals are killed for meat, eggs, and milk every year in the United States? Billions. It's in the United States, it's nine billion. Okay, so that's more animals we're raising for food in the U.S. than there are people on the entire planet. And if you compare this to the rest of the world, where we have over seven billion people, they're raising about 70 billion animals. 
So for us in the U.S., our 340 million Americans are having a huge outsized impact. Okay. Of those 9 billion animals, what percentage of those are raised in those super tight conditions on factory farms? It's 99%. Okay. What what this means is virtually all meat, dairy, and eggs sold in the United States is coming from one of these factory farms. And that's why I do the work that I do. Because I believe that if we are consuming this, then we need to know where it's coming from. And that's where this education component comes in. This is a quote from National Hog Farmer magazine. And in this magazine, they're basically training the farmers on you know, how to go about doing this work. And they say, the breeding sow should be thought of and treated as a valuable piece of machinery whose function is to pump out baby pigs like a sausage machine. Yeah. Yeah. Okay? It is this mindset that allows us to treat these animals in a way that we would never imagine treating our dogs or our cats. And it's this mindset that leads to these really awful conditions on factory farms. And I don't want to belabor the point, but I often try and put a theme to all this, and my theme is, Unnatural problems leading to unnatural solutions. So we thought, hey, instead of having a pig in a room this big, let's put you know 50 pigs in a room this big. Well, if you put 50 pigs in a room this big, they don't have a lot of room, so when they lie down, they suffocate their babies because there's not enough room. Unnatural problem. Our unnatural solution is to put them in gestation crates that are so small they can't turn them out. It's the same kinds of things with you know, chickens. That you've heard about deep beaking. That happens because we don't give the chickens enough room, so they start to peck at each other. They go insane, and so we just cut off their mouths without any anesthetic. So these are the problems that we're dealing with. And I know that there are a lot of soup, especially here in the Bay Area, really conscientious consumers trying to do better. There is some awareness about these issues, and so there are terms like cage-free out there in the world. Who here has seen cage-free before at a grocery store? Right? Now, cage-free does mean that the chickens aren't confined in those super tight battery cages, but they're still crammed into what I think of as a larger cage, which are these sheds. They are still going through that deep eating process. Another term that people ask me about is free range. And free range is cage-free, and they should have access to the outdoors, but I put that in quotes because this is an example of a free range farm. This one is very specific to our area. It's Judy's Family Farm, which is about an hour north of here in Sonoma. And on their package of eggs, they would say, these hens are raised in wide open spaces in Sonoma Valley where they are free to roam, scratch, and play. And on the right, we have an aerial photo of what Judy's family farm actually looks like. And again, it counts as free range because as long as there is a door, then they could theoretically go outside. So that is, you know, it's not what we're envisioning, essentially. And a lot of consumers are not aware of that. I said earlier, oh, hold on, oh, one. I said earlier that 99% of you know, animals are raised in this way. Okay, for chickens, it's 99.9%. You will probably come across somebody in your life who is raising chickens in their backyard. And you can say, and I always say, okay, well, great. So how many eggs is that, you know, backyard chicken laying per week, right? And we'll say it's a very small number. It's not like chickens are normally laying an egg every single day unless they're bred to do that. It's very hard on their bodies. So. If they are getting, say, like five eggs per week, is that enough to supply whole foods for Trader Joe's? No, and so that's why we turn to these kinds of uh, systems. Whole Foods and three, Whole Foods 365 Grand and Organic Valley package their eggs like from Judy's Family Farm. These, it's not like Whole Foods has its own farms, right? They are outsourcing from these other ones. Right. I forgot to mention that at every single section we have these things called cuteness interludes. And I didn't set it up well beforehand, but we do realize that this is a lot of heavy information. So if there are questions, I want to give everybody just a chance to decompress because we know it's a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, could you talk about some of these uh, restaurants or capos uh, that say that they offer free range, which is partially true because, yes, the animals may, may go out, but they don't talk about how long and how much space. So they may have, they can go out, but if it's five minutes a day, that's almost like nothing. So yeah. it's very deceiving. The message is very deceiving still. I, I definitely understand where you're coming from there. What I try and tell people is that if you want that 1% where that chicken is like truly like running around in somebody's backyard, you are probably going to a farmer's market. You're, you can't get that from a grocery store realistically for the most part. You're probably going to a farmer's market. You're probably paying like $12 for a dozen eggs, which is a lot. And that farmer is normally like, yeah, I want to show you why my eggs are so expensive. I want, you, I want you to come to my farm. So that's a lot of steps that will exclude a lot of people. Um, 
The other thing that I want to talk about in my talk, though, is when I meet people who are buying cage-free, organic, and so forth, I am very thoughtful about how I respond to them because I don't want to just be like, don't you know that that's not really what it is and just put them down? Because they're trying, right? They're already, they're aware of the issue. They are reading labels, okay? And that's like basically prerequisites for veganism right there. So I really try and acknowledge that they are trying to get there, that they're trying to be thoughtful. And I'll say, and I used to think that too, and then I also learned this. So that's just my piece of advice. advice to that. Okay, we'll keep going. Let's delve into the environment. Now, one of the things that I think really differentiates FFAC from other organizations is that we're really trying to be intersectional. We were thinking about how our food choices aren't just impacting animals, but also the environment, racial justice. And this line here just blew my mind when I first heard about it. Animal ag is one of the single most destructive industries on the planet. And growing up in the Bay Area, I feel like I was trained to believe that oil spills in the Bay were like the Chevron refinery in Richmond, like that is what environmental destruction looks like. How could Old McDonald be so bad? And it really comes down to the scale, right? We have nine billion living, breathing, eating, pooping animals. And that's where the problems come in. As you probably know, they're eating genetically modified corn and soy grown in monocultures. If any of you have been to the Midwest, for example, you might see what used to be prairies and marshes is now just one thing, right? Which is really bad for a lot of reasons like nitrogen. When I'm talking to students, I'll show this graph and I'll say, hey, who here has $100? Would you give me that $100 if in exchange I gave you a coupon worth $40? And they're like, no, Monica, that's ridiculous, right? I say, well, what if I give you a voucher to your favorite restaurant worth $3 for your $100? They're like, ridiculous, Monica. And what I'm truly trying to say is that's what we're doing with our food, right? We have to grow a lot of corn and soy to feed those animals. And for every 100 calories of corn and soy that we give to animals, we get back 40 calories worth of milk down to just 3 calories worth of beef. The way that I explain this to the kids is like if you can imagine having a dog and stockpiling all the dog food your dog eats in the entire year, the weight of the dog food, the calories in that dog food is far greater than the actual flesh on the dog's bones itself. This is a problem because it's a really inefficient source of food. We know that if everyone ate half as much meat, you could take half of the land that's growing corn and soy and use that land to grow food to feed people directly. Fruits, vegetables, grains, legumes, right? If we did that, we could feed everyone on Earth today, plus an extra two billion people. You might know that the Amazon rainforest has been on fire. <laughs> we have not really been talking about this. One of the leading causes for that is so that we can have more cows grazing, we can have more land to grow corn and soy. And these are the Earth's lungs. And of course that has a really big impact on the indigenous communities in the area. When we talk about overpopulation, I think we often focus only on humans. There was a time when 100% of mammals on this planet were wild mammals. But now we've shrunk that down to just 4%. And then you can see that 96% are humans and they're livestock. And that's what's causing a lot of the issues that we have in our family. Okay. The other issue with all this corn and soy is that it's very water intensive. And as Californians, we hear about the drought a lot. And literally every single year that I was growing up, I was told, Monica, you need to take shorter showers. Monica, you need to turn off the tap while you're brushing your teeth. And today, in 2019, I can guarantee you, I go to every single school and I say, what do you do to conserve water? And every kid says, take shorter showers. So that messaging is strong in our California public schools. But a lot of our messaging only focuses on our direct water usage, not our indirect water usage. It turns out that if somebody skips a gallon of milk just one time, that's the equivalent of saving 27 showers. 27 days of showers. And you might be thinking, well, why does it require so much water for just like this innocuous gallon of milk? Like it's just a gallon of milk and I have to break it down for the kids. And I say, okay, well, that cow had to eat corn and soy. That required a lot of water. They were drinking, there was production, so there's a lot there. I brought in this graphic also from the New York Times because one of the other issues that I get asked about a lot is, what about almond milk? Does an almond milk require so much water? Almond milk does require water, but not nearly as much as dairy milk does, okay? And if you are only thinking about water, then hey, maybe you want to be consuming soy milk or oat milk, but if you're looking at things from other environmental perspectives, such as land use or carbon emissions, 
those are some other things to be thinking about. So I never tell people what to drink. I'm not saying that there's any one perfect thing, but I've noticed that there are certain factors that get into the American public imagination, like almond milk uses up a lot of water. And we can acknowledge that, but again, say it's not nearly as much as dairy milk. And water is not the only factor here. There's other environmental factors to consider as well. Okay. So we've got our nine billion animals. They're consuming all of this corn and soy. Yeah, you can just skip that, actually. And the problem with all of this is that it's leading to a lot of waste. And we don't know what to do with this waste. And as Lauren talked about in her previous talk, we have things like hog farms where it's basically going, all this waste is going into these pools. And those pools eventually overflow. So the only way that we can get rid of this waste is to spray it up into the air <laughs> and the hopes that it will evaporate. This is horrific because we've got people living in the area who are breathing in that air asthma, you know, all sorts of issues. There is so much that I could say about this, but if I were to show you the video, they do pull out the term environmental racism, and it's very important to acknowledge, because if a hog factory farm wanted to open up in San Francisco, you sure as heck know that we would fight it, right? We would use our political, educational, and financial resources, and we would say, no, not in my backyard. We do not want to have this hog factory farm here. We do not want our children to be sick. So where do hog factory farms end up? Where do these CAFOs end up? In the lowest income communities, which tend to be communities of color. And as you saw last year, we are dealing with climate change, so now there are things like hurricanes that are more frequent. So this is actually a picture after Hurricane Florence last year, which took all of that waste and just like flooded the area with it. And I bring this up because I used to work for an organization whose you know, major focus was getting kids to bring reusable water bottles to school, and I think that's a really great initiative, but that cannot be our only <laughs> environmental initiative because not everybody can drink water from the tap, right? These kids in this particular area cannot. And it's not just North Carolina. If you flip through, you know that water contamination in communities of color is nothing new. You saw what happened in Flint. This lady here lives just a little bit south of a dairy farm. She cannot drink her water either. Okay, so we've got all this waste. Keep going, Gonzalo. We know that all of this animal agriculture is causing more greenhouse gas emissions than the entire transportation sector combined. And that the impact from that is so great that if everybody in the US ate no meat or cheese just one day a week, it would be like taking 7.6 million cars off the road. And I encourage everybody to memorize that stat. I use it all the time because it illustrates the impact that our food choices can have. And it's something that we can actually do something about because a lot of us do not have control over larger, you know, wind power things, solar panels, like hybrids, refrigeration, all that stuff. This is something people could be doing right now. And for a lot of kids, they can't imagine um, telling their parents to sell their cars and never drive again. That's really hard for them. But they can't imagine eating a plant-based meal one day a week. Okay. Any questions there? Well, there was something about milk that you alluded to earlier, and, and I heard in a previous lecture that milk is, you know, how bad that is. Uh, totally opposite from the propaganda from the milk industry, got milk, uh, does the body good, and I don't know what the latest BS is on that, but there's, they've been, uh, there's also a cultural influence that uh, may or may not be correct depending on the caloric intake, uh, say, you know, cultures where they value, they actually uh, sanctify, you know, um, living uh, bovines, they're, they're part of the culture, it's considered almost a divine uh, symbol. So for them, milk is purity. And is, is there any, any truth to that, depending on where they're at and their tolerance? Well, actually, if I can hold off on this question sure. for a little bit, because I want to talk a little bit about culture okay. and milk and yeah, later. later, but that's a very good point, thank you. I think I actually make this point in the racial justice section, so keep going. Okay. Let's keep on flipping through this because we just don't have a lot of time. It's just talking about the slaughterhouse workers and how <laughs> there's so many things that we could be saying about how terrible factory farming is. Um, but I actually go back to the previous one, Gonzalo. So 
When a hog factory farm comes to a community, they will say that we are extraordinarily benevolent. We are bringing so much opportunity and jobs to this community. But it's a lot like Walmart. When Walmart comes to a community, what you see is the small little grocery store will go out of business. The small little hardware store goes out of business. If you talk to a lot of farmers in middle America, they are upset right now because they are really struggling to survive financially. And factory farming is a huge issue here. If you go to the next slide, you'll, one of the, I want to talk about one of the reasons why we eat the way that we do, and it really comes back to the farm bill. Who here has studied the farm bill in the past is aware of it? Okay, just a few of us. <laughs> Louise here is our farm bill expert. <laughs> Louise is a senior at, here at San Francisco High School, and then this right here is Gonzalo. He is a freshman at SF State. <laughs> so, um, so I talk a lot about the Farm Bill, and I'm shocked that more people don't know about it, but not surprised. So the Farm Bill passes through Congress every five years. The 2014 Farm Bill was worth $489 billion in subsidies. 63% okay? of those subsidies went to meat and dairy. 20% went to grains, which you know that we feed to meat and dairy. Okay? Less than 1% of that subsidy went towards fruits and vegetables. So there is a reason why when you go to certain communities, you see that a Big Mac is cheaper than a salad. Okay? And what people have access to is directly impacting their health as well. So this is something that we need to be raising more awareness around. And unfortunately, there are a lot of really strong lobbying groups like you know, the USB Council, US Dairy Council that have a lot of influence <coughs> in our Congress right now. So again, this leads to the types of things that Lauren was talking about earlier, food deserts, food apartheid. Again, the distinction being that food deserts make it sound as though there's no food anywhere. If you go to low-income communities, there is food, there are liquor stores, there are fast food stores, but the quality of the food isn't great. And so that's why we're talking about food apartheid and the legislative reasons why things are the way that they are. Keep going. What people eat has a direct impact on their health, and you can see that certain communities are more uh, prone to having things like diabetes or cardiovascular disease because of what of the food that they have access to. All right, so now let's get a little bit to your point here, which is talking about dairy. Okay, so I've been using the term lactose intolerance in our presentation just because that's a term that the kids know, but yeah, lactose normal as well. <laughs> to quote Lori. So this map here is showing you rates of lactose intolerance or lactose normal all around the world. And you can see that the darker regions are where people are most lactose intolerant. I want to take us in a little bit of a thought process here and just thinking about how a lot of Asians, Africans, Native Americans, indigenous people are lactose intolerant. And recognizing that we do drink cow's milk in this country because Europeans colonized this land, and when they colonized this land, they started to encourage everybody to eat <laughs> the same way that they did. So it is not an accident that every single public school kid here in the United States gets cow's milk for breakfast and lunch at their schools. There's a reason for that. It's connected to the farm bill. Um, I used to be a teacher on the Navajo Reservation. It was my first, one of my first jobs. I was a third grade teacher, and we were a very low income school. So all of our breakfasts and lunches were free. <laughs> they were subsidized. Whenever my principal forced me to do cafeteria duty, I literally had to go around to all the kids and say, open your milk, open your milk. And I did that over and over again. I did that for years, because my principal told me that if I didn't make the kids drink their milk, then we wouldn't get our funding. We wouldn't even let them get water. <laughs> and this was really bothersome to me. And again, it's like why I'm up here doing this right now. Because it really hurt me to realize that I had to force my little eight-year-old indigenous children to drink cow's milk when I knew it wasn't good for their tummies. And you know that lactose intolerance, it's not like you drink cow's milk and you die, right? It's just like it really upsets your stomach. They would get very gassy. They would go to the bathroom a lot. They would miss class time also. And in a school where I had very few resources, I was always getting posters from Got Milk ads, right, with these like Taylor Swift on them, and the kids were supposed to use this book covers, or we were supposed to post it in the cafeteria, and 
it was just the messaging that we got. You know, 80% of us were seeing a got milk, got milk ad every single day, you know, in the early 2000s. It's very pervasive. We were told that you need to drink milk to build strong bones, and it's just like, take shorter showers for the drought. Like, <laughs> it's just like this very strong messaging that has um, pervaded our society. Well, let's, I want to fight back against that as well, because if you look at China, which is an extremely lactose intolerant country, you can probably not think of a single Chinese dish that contains dairy or cheese, right? A single Chinese? Yes, is there a single Chinese dish that contains dairy or cheese? No, right? Like, no. <laughs> and people in China have lower rates of osteoporosis right. than we do in the United right. States. Okay? So I always want to talk to kids about absorbable calcium. I like to talk to the kids about why we eat the things that we do and peel back the layers and talk about colonization and stuff like that. Is it true that 75% of the world's population is lactose intolerant? I usually say about like two thirds of 70%. Yeah. Yes? I've also heard that people who uh, drink milk are more osteoporosis prone. It could be that way just because like I've heard that there's a protein in the cow's milk that inhibits the uptake of the calcium, so it's just not absorbable. And maybe if you're consuming more cow's milk, you're not eating as many other like calcium rich foods. Yeah. I grew up I grew up in the Midwest, my parents were from Wisconsin and milk, 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 cheese, cheese, cheese. Mm -hmm. I have mm -hmm. osteoporosis. Mm -hmm. Oh, it has the highest? Yeah. Alright, so I want to get to this last section so I can go into um, our training. All across the board, you know, <laughs> the world leaders, apart from our own, are saying the basic solution is simple. We do need to be eating less meat. I'm not saying none, but they are saying like you do have to eat a lot less. If you look at Project Drawdown, climate activist Paul Hawkett analyzed the top 100 scientific solutions to addressing climate change. You'll see that two of the top five are directly related to what we eat. This is truly one of the most meaningful ways that we can address climate change. And at an individual level, this is huge. I have been giving these presentations many, many times, and I can tell you that something is different now. Kids really do care about what's happening to our planet. When I was growing up, climate change was this faraway thing that was happening to some country in Asia that would be underwater at some point. Now, we couldn't go outside last November for 12 days. We know that the power outages are happening. We know that um, not everybody has N95 masks or the ability to stay indoors and with their air purifiers. We've seen these climate justice issues. We know that climate change is happening and we don't know about what's going to really happen after 2050. The kids are aware of this. They want to do something. We are striking. We are raising awareness. And Greta here, who's, you know, helped to propel this, is saying, yeah, <laughs> we got to eat a lot less meat and animal products. There are some other organizations that we usually highlight, but I'm going to be skipping through them. So keep going, Gonzalo. But again, it's just sort of like what Lauren was talking about in her last talk. We always highlight these organizations. And Sometimes in our schools, okay, we talk about, uh, you know, these kinds of initiatives like Meatless Mondays. My concern with Meatless Mondays is just that Meatless makes it sound like you're taking something away from people and they respond pretty negatively to that. Uh, but this started as a public health initiative and it's been very successful. San Francisco even has a resolution around it. A lot of places do. And many people have reported participating here. Can we substitute meat free for yeah. Meatless? Yeah, keep going. Well, it depends on the angle that you want to take. We have another campaign as well. Uh -huh. Oh, actually, go back. We do talk about you know some of these food tech startups in our presentations, just because we know that when we have kids who are used to eating Kentucky Fried Chicken, we cannot expect them to go out and eat a zucchini the next day, even though that's truly like I would love all children to be eating zucchinis <laughs> because I think that eating more of a whole foods plant based diet is very good for our health. But there has to be that transition food, and so that's what this is. And the fastest growing sector of the grocery store industry are these plant-based foods, and I think that our presentations are creating some of that demand. I don't think that everybody goes vegan immediately after our presentations, but it's this whole demand is being really driven by Generation Zers and Millennials, people who are being a little bit more conscious about their food choices and purchasing things like this. The fact that here in the Bay Area, you know, milk alternatives are so ubiquitous is huge because that then told Walmart, oh, we should start to serve that as well in some of our other stores. And I'm not saying go out and support Walmart, but where I was on the Navajo reservation, that's what we had. 
and now my kids can go to Walmart and purchase a non-dairy milk alternative, which is huge. All right, you're seeing fast food chains. This is not for you all. <laughs> this would be for a different audience. Oh wait, go back, Gonzalo. So I also always do, and by the way, on that other side, I was talking about how 9 out of 10 Americans don't get enough vegetables. So don't worry, that's still part of my messaging. <laughs> still want to get the kids eating more healthily. And then I introduced Green Monday, which is what I prefer over Meatless Monday because it emphasizes the environmental sustainability impacts of our food choices. And that is our in right now. Pretty much every single company has a sustainability team or initiative, or club, or something like that. You see that at all the schools. There are a lot of sustainability goals for cities and counties. So this is where we've been really effective. What we say is that there's many different ways to go about doing this. It can be routine-based. It could be reducing more. It can start off by you know eating a lot less beef, right? Again, we never say that we're taking something away from people. So you know, I do do that thing where I say, hey. <laughs> Have a bowl filled with grains and veggies and put two ounces of steak on top. So at least you're eating less, right, as opposed to a whole steak. That's still less demand because I speak to a lot of different people. <laughs> we had Green Mondays passed in Berkeley, which is a really big deal because Berkeley is a city that is actually incorporating food into its climate action plan. So their city council members are eating vegan at their meetings. Berkeley City and facilities are doing that one day a week. My interns and volunteers, we went to every single restaurant in Berkeley to make sure that they had a veg option so we could feature them on our Green Monday website. <laughs> yeah, a lot of food, a lot of them. And so if any of you have companies or know many schools that want to do Green Monday, we create a team page for you, and then let's say 11 people afterwards pledge to join, then we can calculate exactly how much water, uh, carbon, et cetera, that you, you are saving. And so that can be put into your school's climate action plan or company's action plan. We do competitions between various teams as well, which can be fun with like all the shirts and hats and so on. All right, so let's now get to this next section. Keep going. We do have that internship program, by the way, so please tell everybody you know about the internship program. Um, and now let's talk about how we go into these schools and we deal with all these questions, not actually not just in schools, but just in our personal lives as well, because I do think that this is something that people could take with them after this talk. My first piece of advice I'd like to share is really just making it about yourself. Okay. So Al Gore has this big like cupcake analogy. Is anybody familiar with the cupcake analogy? Where he talks about how really like the heart of what, what you're talking about is like your own story and really the sprinkles are the facts. So you don't want to give people too many facts. That's why when I said memorize this one fact about people eating you no know, meat one day a week would be like 7.6 million cars off of the road, that's enough. <laughs> right? Like you don't need to memorize that many more facts because really what people are interested in is the story and really just making it about yourself. Um, go to the next one. And the next thing that I like to do is really redirect questions. Sometimes, you know, I have really antagonistic audiences that will be talking to me about how the plants I'm eating are suffering or something like that, right? They're, they're, they are just responding to this information. They're just like, you are upsetting me. Like, I want to turn it on to you. And I say, okay, if I were to then go like, okay, well, the scientific research shows this stuff about like plants and their feelings, I completely lost my battle because that's not really what this is about. So if a student asks me, hey, aren't you worried about all the plants? I say, well, I am eating some plants, but also if I was eating meat, right, those animals would be eating even more plants. <laughs> so now let's talk more about the plants and, and really about this whole system, right? So I, I try and be thoughtful about where I want my conversation to go. I don't want it to go into the cells of plants and their feelings. Um, Another question that I mentioned earlier was something along the lines of, if you're stranded on a deserted island and there was like a pig there, would you eat it? And what I always say is, you know, I've never been stranded on a deserted island like I, <laughs> and so I don't know what I would do, right? But I do know that I live here in Oakland now and I have access to Mandela Grocery Co-op in this place and I'm able to purchase these things and so that's been able you know, make it about the current present, all right? Don't go, they want to, <laughs> to go into like, the, they want to trip you up, blah, blah, blah. Just, sometimes people are like so angry and they expect you to be angry and then if you're not angry, they're like, oh. <laughs> so, 
So that's what we do there. Um, again, finding that common ground. So that example I said earlier, especially here in the Bay Area, there's so many people who are like, oh, but I buy cage-free or I buy organic. Like, I got this covered. I'm doing my part. And I used to be like, oh my gosh, there's so much more you could be doing. Don't you know the truth about this? But again, I'll find that common ground. So if they are an environmentalist, I will say, yeah, I really care a lot about the planet too. And so I thought that if I were just, you know, try uh, eating more cage-free eggs, like that was helping. But then I realized I could do even more if I did this for someone. Right? Finding that common ground, say, I care about the planet. I rode my bike everywhere. But then I realized that if I were to not buy cow's milk, it was like the saving of 27 showers, something like that. So really trying to meet people where they're at. And you can see that in my messaging around Green Monday as well, which I know is you know, something that can be a little controversial because I know a lot of us want everybody to go vegan right away. <laughs> and I really wish that that could happen. But I've been doing this at enough schools in so many different communities to realize that if I force that and I don't give them the tools, I don't teach them how to do that, I'm not there mentoring them like every step of the way, they do it in a really unhealthy way, right? Instead of eating uh, pepperoni pizza, they just eat cheese pizza. Instead of eating burgers and fries, they just eat fries. And then they have health issues, which is not good. <laughs> and then they're like, it's all veganism's fault. So I really try and meet people where they're at. Does anybody have any questions or any scenarios that they get asked all the time? And we can sort of like brainstorm how we would sort of address them. Yeah. Uh, just bringing out the cage-free eggs thing, I found out that actually the term cage-free or cageless is not regulated. So actually, you can put that label on any set of eggs you want, and like you can't be sued because it's not a regulated label. Oh, wow. um, there are a few labels that are regulated, as in you actually have to meet some standard of you know, like getting a certain amount of chicken uh, space to the chickens that are like, regulated, but they're a lot rarer and they're a lot more expensive. There are a lot of terms out there that like the USDA might uh, regulate like organic, but again, it doesn't necessarily mean what we think it means. Another term that people often bring up is pasture-raised. That will have like individual certifiers, so then you know, there could be multiple certifiers all using the terms pasture-raised. But cage-free and cageless are actually, nobody like regulates that one. There's no independent certifier, there's no FDA thing. Like, you could take basically any egg and slap cage free and like you couldn't be sued for it. Like all natural. Yeah. yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I wanted to add that she found out which ones are true to that label, you know, the companies that are true to that label. Well, I, I mean, I'm vegan, so I don't buy eggs, but uh, uh, when I was looking into it, there are, I don't remember what the labels are, there are a few labels where there is like an independent certifier who does monitor it, so, you know, like, I, I, they can't just slap on the label because they want to sell more, you know, like, they actually have to meet the standards, but I don't remember what those specific terms are, but they're a lot less common than cageless eggs, and I also know they're a lot more expensive. Can you look that up? Sometimes if you know the farmer, if you can, if you can visit the farm, that helps. I'm asking for my customers because they all look at it. It takes a lot of research, actually. Um, like I said, you know, a lot of people would say that pasture raised is the best, but then you'd have to find out which certifier it is. Comment on the subject of climate change, I found, uh, can you comment on the fact how all the discussions that we see in the media right now during the presidential elections, uh, whether it listens to the radio, uh, hardly any of it talks about animal agriculture. It's all about, even the fibers in Brazil, they, yeah. they, they just, just gloss over the fact, they did talk about, you know, oil, 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 mm -hmm. uh, you know, cars, but nothing, almost nothing about animal it hurts my ears. This company, you know, just, I don't know what something behind it. There's too much big money behind it. Yeah. And we're afraid to say anything. Is that what is your opinion on that? Yeah, I have a lot to say about that. Louise, can you be passing around the email sign ups? Because we want to send everybody the press so that they have the facts that they would like. So if you want to get that, or if you just want to be on our newsletter so you know about our other events, that'd be great. Um, this is really why we started FFAC in the first place. Because, again, we see a ton of information in schools about 
the environment and sustainability. And a lot of it is really basic along the lines of like bring your reusable water bottle. Right? We're not pushing people hard enough. We've been doing this <laughs> since I was a kid. <laughs> and we've definitely advanced since then. So we need to be doing a lot more. I asked the kids, why is it that we eat meat? Okay? And the list is always the same in every school that I go to. It's it's tasty, right? So that I say, okay, let's meet you on that, right? Let's give you this <laughs> garden, let's give you the beyond meat, all that kind of stuff. So we have to talk about taste. It's a valid one. We need to talk about taste. They also will talk about culture. It's a part of our culture. And then sometimes I push them a little bit more to find out like when did it become a part of your culture, right? Like with dairy, or the idea that you eat turkey at Thanksgiving, because you know the pilgrims and the Indians didn't get around at dinner table and eat turkey. Right? So when did this become a part of our culture? And I put I push them a little bit on that for sure. But I do recognize that like now it has become a part of the culture and so we need to have, have those substitutes. And then we along those lines we talk about how food is really connected to family and a lot of people have a lot of discomfort around talking about food because for, food feels very personal for everybody. And so then we talk about how we still need to introduce it into conversation and how to do that in a way that doesn't shut people off because we certainly have seen that happen before. I think that there are many reasons why food is still being left out of the conversation. And I think that a lot of nonprofits focus so much on a singular social justice issue like just climate change or just animal rights, and there hasn't been enough crossover between them, and that's something that we're trying to do as well. And when you do work for a singular social justice organization, like say it's some big non environmental nonprofit here in San Francisco, like who is funding them, right? And where is that pressure coming from? How do we, <laughs> again, how can we make sure that food is included in the conversation and bring it up in a way that doesn't threaten their funders so that they can still continue to do the good work that they do. It's really hard. It's really hard. But that is the goal of our work. Yeah, I wanted to say that the media, and it's privately owned by the you know, multinationals that they own the company, the, the agricultural company, at the same time the newspaper. Exactly. So, yeah, so, I mean, unless you read independent media, but if you read the, any corporate media, they will give you the corporate, uh, you know, picture. But in the base, the, for the, the Democratic Democrats base, they, 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 they definitely uh, regard climate change as a number one issue, if not number two, number one, number two. Yeah, they don't talk about it. Well, well, they, don't want, they don't want to upset or scare too many people well, away. Well, because they, they're guess, funded, they're they're funded, funded not it's too much. I guess it's just too too radical, too different, too much information, and they're, I guess they, maybe they're afraid you're just going to lose voters that way because it's just, let's face it, most of the world, not just the country, the world, this is this is news. This is, this is not common knowledge. So that's my, just my belief. I don't it's also the lobby groups, like she was saying, the lobbyists, they rule Washington and a lot of other... Elizabeth Warren supports the Dairy Act. She supports what? The Dairy Act. What's that? Um, that's the one they said. <laughs> the Dairy Act. Oh, okay. Yeah. But she doesn't publicly say it, but she does. Okay, so my time, I think, is up, right? <laughs> okay, so I don't want to take over uh, the next person's presentation, but I'm happy to continue this conversation if this is what I do. Feel free to take my business card. Um, I'm happy to answer questions or give presentations wherever you'd like me to come for any of our interns. And then if um, you can just fill out our sign-up sheet, that would be really helpful because I do want to give you this information so that you have it. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.